so Chitin and I, I think we're quite excited to talk to you today uh, about ICRIS, our initiative that aims at addressing the antibody liability crisis. So ICRIS establishes an open science ecosystem, extremely collaborative. So we team up with several antibody manufacturers to identify high quality antibodies for all human proteins. So all the ICRIS scientific activities are performed at the neurals of the Montreal Neurological Institute. At the moment, we are a group of five individuals and we're looking to, to grow. Uh, I'm leading the scientific team at the neural and Chitin Reda on the call is our CEO. Okay, so you purchase a navigation system to provide you with geolocalization and with the best route to get you to a certain destination. You know, if the GPS was telling you to go north, but you have to go south, you would be quite frustrated. You would never buy a navigation system that's accurate half of the time. You purchase an antibody as you expect to precisely detect one protein out of a chaotic mixture of proteins. However, a high proportion of antibodies do not perform as advertised. And yet scientists purchase and use antibodies without proper characterization. So there's an antibody liability crisis. It costs $1 billion annually. It leads to wrong hypothesis, waste of research time. The use of non-specific antibodies is at the heart of the reproducibility crisis observed in biomedical research. So our rationale is that we should be able to identify high quality antibodies for most human proteins with proper characterization. So let me take my little laser. So several years ago, in like in 2003, the antibody coverage of human protein wasn't as high as now. So there was in 2003 at least 50,000 commercial available antibodies. And at the time, CRISPR-Cas9 was not you know, known and there was really few knockout cell lines available. So character characterizing antibodies was indeed challenging. But nowadays, there's 2.5 million antibodies when I look this morning at the antibody registry. It doesn't mean there's 2.5 unique antibodies, but it tells us that there's a high number of unique antibodies for any human proteins. And we did this analysis with Anita Verdowski at PsyCrunch, and we found that 85% of human proteins are covered by at least 20 commercial antibodies. And in our hand, we've done a lot of these tests. And usually when we test 10 to 15 antibodies, we can find good ones for several applications. At the moment, knockout cells are commercially available or can be generated routinely in labs. And this is what we're doing at McGill. The real problem is here. How to recognize good antibodies from the bad ones, right? The identification of high quality antibodies is problematic. So at the moment, selecting an antibody for a certain protein target is very challenging. We heavily depend on characterization data provided by the manufacturers. So when you ask a PhD student or a postdoc, how do you select your antibody that you want to purchase? You will have various answers. Some people like only monoclonals. Others like to use the most cited antibodies. Um, sometimes you don't have much choices and you have one or two antibodies available for your protein of interest. At the time, I was studying c 72 antibody, and there was really just one, a Santa Cruz antibody, and unfortunately, it was not specific for C9, which led to a lot of confusion in the field. Um, some people actually don't like commercial antibody, and they generate their homemade. Um, bottom line, I, I don't really think that it matters too much how you really select your antibody, but what is crucial is that you characterize your antibodies for the application and cell line that you'll be using. So here is our solution to the actual crisis. So we are partnering with nine antibody manufacturers and one knockout cell line provider to develop an antibody characterization platform that we are currently implementing at the Montreal Neurological Institute. And this platform takes advantage of knockout cell lines. 
So we prefer we perform head-to-head -head comparisons of the antibodies by Western blot that we call immunoprecipitation. That we call immunoblot. We perform antibodies by immunoprecipitation and immunofluorescence. Each partner contribute antibodies or knockout cells um, to this effort free of charge. We have monthly advisory committee with a senior representative of each of these companies to review our antibody characterization reports, to review our protocols, talk about data dissemination, and we inform them about the new proteins that have been nominated. So the platform that we develop goes as follows. So target is first nominated um, by a founder. So the target is analyzed through various databases. A crucial criteria for successful antibody characterization studies is the identification of high expressing cell lines of the protein of interest. So we use StepMap, which is a very useful resource developed by the broad they have gathered information about RNA expression and proteomics for more than a thousand cancer cell lines. Okay, so then we request, or then we request um, knockout cell lines if they are available in the high expressing cell line background. So our partners have several of these, or if we need to, we need to generate our own custom knockout line, then we do so. We request antibodies as well. And we first screen all the antibodies by Western blot, which help us to first uh, validate the knockout cell line that we are using. And at the same time, we validate the antibodies for Western blot. Then we characterize the antibodies for precipitation and IF. And we recently got more funding to develop uh, IHC screen. And then we put all this data together, we prepare an antibody characterization report that we share with our, uh, with our partners and that we review during our monthly advisory committees. And then we post on Zenodo. So at the moment, our antibody characterization reports are available on the Zenodo repository, on the ICRIS website, or very recently on the antibody registry. And this is very helpful because now you can um, search the antibody that you want, and you will see if there's any available ICRIS characterization data. Okay, so I would like to show you some characterization data for two very different protein targets. The first one is MATRIN3, uh, a protein linked to amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. It's a poorly characterized protein, I like to call it a dark protein. There's 93 PubMed entries. And the knockout line that we use for the generation of the uh, antibody characterization data is a line that was provided by one of our partner, Horizon Discovery. And I'll give you some more data about um, Parkin, the h 3 b protein like is Parkin, a major protein involved in Parkinson disease, heavily studied, more than 9,000 PubMed entries. And you'll see that unfortunately, uh, the field has been using an antibody that is subperforming. Okay, so let's start with Matrin 3. So we nominated Matrin 3. Um, our partners provided us, provided us with all these different antibodies here. You have the lot number, the RRID, the clonality, and you see that some of them are recombinant and thus are renewable through time. Um, Etc. and the uh, cell lines that we have received and used. So in our antibody characterization reports, this is you know, the tables that you see up front. And then we screen out the antibodies by Western blot. So each of these panels have on the left a wall type lysate and the matching three knockout lysate. And each panel have been blotted with a different antibody. And the name of the antibody is here, okay? So some antibodies are very specific and very selective. Some antibodies are specific, but not perfectly selective. You see that the antibody recognizes non-specific balance. And there are some antibodies that just stop performs, okay? And then we screen out the antibodies by immunoprecipitation. 
Um, I think I'll go to panel B here. So we always know the starting material, which is the, ah, the starting material. It's 10% 10 10 starting material. And then we run the unbound fraction, which is the fraction that we collect right after the IP. So if an antibody is able to capture mastering tree by immunoprecipitation, the immuno, the unbound fraction should be depleted um, of mastering tree like here. And you see that the, in the IP, of course, you have an enrichment of mastering tree. So we could identify great antibodies for immunoprecipitation, which is cool. Now you can use these tools to pull down um, matching trees, study binding partners, center spec, analyze post translational modification, and so on. And then all the antibodies are screened by immunofluorescence. And we use a cool trick that I learned during my, my PhD as a Drosophila geneticist. So we use a mosaic strategy. We label wall type cells with a GFP cell dye and a knockout cell with a far red cell dye. And then we put them together. We can distinguish the wall type cells from the knockout cells because they have different fluorescent marker. And we stain the antibody in a channel that is not used by any of these, uh, any of the dyes. And this, in this case, it's the red channel. So here we're showing only the red channel. So it is a channel um, from the antibody signal. Okay. And you see that some antibodies perform extremely well. So the wild type cells are outlined by a yellow dotted line here. You see in the knockout cell line, there's no more signal. Whereas there's some antibodies, unfortunately, uh, that are not specific by immunofluorescence. So for ALS, uh, we have received funding to screen antibodies for all ALS disease genes. There's around 25 of them. We've done 13, which are highlighted here. Here you see the number of antibodies that we tested. And I just wanted to show you that our rational, which is, you know, we, we should be able to identify good antibodies for most human proteins is right. These proteins are poorly characterized. They're, they're within the dark genome, which is proteins that are poorly studied, but involved in diseases. For all of them, we found good antibodies to our Western blood. Most of them have at least one good antibodies by IP, but immunofluorescence is the most challenging application. And there's unfortunately three targets that we couldn't at the moment identify um, a good antibody by IF, which is okay. We inform our partners about these gaps and then they see this as an opportunity to develop new antibodies to fill these gaps. So we revisit after a while, when there's new antibodies that have been developed, we revisit these reports and test these new antibodies and hopefully identify uh, good ones. Okay, now let's go from ALS to Parkinson's disease. Let's talk about Parkin. So we receive a whole bunch of antibodies. Main, most of them are recombinant, monoclonals, and some polyclonals. And yeah, a lot of it, a lot of cell lines have been used. But what I'm going to show you today is um, the, the lines that we use for antibody characterization are the SHSY5Y. And we show properly that these lines express the highest amount of Parkin within a whole range of tested cell lines. OK, so we go ahead. We tested one, two, three, four, five, six, all the antibodies that we received. And yeah, as you can see, it's pretty messy. There's a lot of bands, hard to distinguish a specific band. So I don't know if I can zoom here, but there's a, there's a band here that is, uh, that is Parkin. You see that the, that band is, you know, disappeared in the knockout lines. You know, when you see blocks like this, it's, there's clearly a gap, but Parkin, you know, is heavily studied and there's a clear need to develop new good tools for this protein. Um, this antibody here and this antibody here are indeed the same clone, which is called the Parkin-8 clone, which has been used in 446 site patients. Okay. So we presented this first preliminary data to our advisory committee. And luckily, Thermo was keen to develop new antibodies, new recombinant antibodies. And thankfully, um, generated high-class antibodies for parking. 
So we showed this data internally at the neuro, and they were so excited. Now we generated already data proving that dopaminergic neurons are expressing the most parking, and we're doing some IP, some aspect. Um, this antibody drives fun. <laughs> And then we screen all these antibodies by immunoprecipitation. And these two antibodies here, so the two new recombinant antibodies by thermal, were the only one that could capture every single parking molecule from that cell lysase. And you see here the enrichment that is just fantastic. Unfortunately, all the antibodies, while you know, while being tested by IF, showed no specific signal. So at the moment, there's still a gap. In terms of in terms of specific antibodies for immunofluorescence for parking. But we think we might have identified a cool kind of a strategy here. So we found through a cell and panel that dopaminergic neuron expresses way more parking than these SH5Y5 cell lines. So this might be helpful to identify new, you know, specific signal using these thermal antibodies, for example. So we will revisit this screening using now dopaminergic neurons. So, you know, we've done 50 proteins up to now and there's still 19,550 19, proteins to do so. Um, so in the case of studying the proteins that we haven't characterized antibodies for, I, I highly recommend to characterize your antibodies, either by knockdown, knock, knock, knockouts, but the application for which you're doing it is very important. So I'll take now a few minutes to show you some analysis that we can do using the characterization data that we generated at Icarus. Um, so we have tested around 300 antibodies for all three applications using our knockout-based platform, okay? And globally, in terms of Western blot, 62% of them behaved, I don't like to say behave well, but we're specific by Western blot. 35% of the antibodies could capture its intended target by immunoprecipitation and 25% by IF. However, as you know, uh, antibodies are fit for purpose reagents. So manufacturers are recommending specific application for their antibodies. So here's the performance of the antibodies that went through, a pla through our platform. Now in comparison with manufacturer's recommendation. So out of the 300-ish antibodies that we tested for Western blood, 290 were recommended by Western blood. And most performed well or specific. Out of the 300 or so antibodies that we tested by IP, only 50 were recommended by, by IP and only half of them really worked. And out of these 300 or so antibodies that we tested for IF, 160 were recommended by the manufacturer for IF. And this is quite distressing here, but only 40% really show the specific signal um, when compared to a knockout cell line. So if you look at the IF, so these 160 antibodies here, that we characterized by IF, were used in 93 plus 80 in 173 articles. There's 80 articles that use one of these, that, these antibodies that were specific. So 80 articles that use specific antibodies by IF. So that is great. However, there's 93%, sorry, there's 93 articles that used antibodies that were not specific. So we are slowly building this kind, of, this kind of data as well. Um, and using our platform, we identified antibodies that were performing well for application that was not recommended or tested by manufacturers. So now manufacturers can add these application in their data sheet. For example, there's 27 antibodies that perform really well by IP, but that, were, that was not probably tested by the manufacturers. Okay, and I think I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give the, the, the microphone to Chet and it will give you a bit more information about, about Icarus. Uh, thanks, Carl. So I just uh, will spend just two minutes. Uh, it's an interesting uh, kind of business model as well because 
uh, we have all of these companies providing us with their antibodies and we're testing them and we're putting the data out in the open, no patents, no restrictions. Uh, we present our data to the companies uh, for comment, but they're not allowed to uh, remove data um, even when the data show that their antibody does not perform well. So, um, you know, it's really uh, been an exercise in gaining their trust that we're doing good science um, for them to participate with us. Um, and so, uh, you know, they've really been uh, uh, key partners in refining the methodology and approving uh, you know how we how we do things, uh, and also in using our data for their own purposes. So Carl mentioned, um, if you see that uh, you know, Parkin, for instance, does not have a specific antibody, then you can redirect your research efforts to uh, coming up with a Parkin antibody. Versus, like if Natrin three shows that there are antibodies that are already on the market that perform quite well. Uh, well, then scientific, you know, business-wise, excuse me, it may not make as much sense to direct your research efforts there. Uh, similarly, uh, many of these uh, companies uh, who are all committed to kind of putting good, high-quality products on the market have removed products from their catalog when our tests show that their products did not perform as advertised. So, um, you know, we're proud of the, the partnerships. We think these companies all uh, are trying to do good business. Um, and they're involved with us uh, for all of the, the right reasons. So, uh, you know, we continue to expand uh, the partnerships um, and you know, we want to just have more and more companies to the point where our hope is that one day, basically every antibody that's on the market will have been characterized by us in an independent, uh, transparent manner. Uh, and the last point I wanted to make was uh, it's an interesting science and business problem. Uh, you know, the antibodies are used to test the knockout and the knockout is used to test the antibodies. So, you know, the more antibodies and the more knockout cells you have you kind of create this um, matrix uh, that just raises the quality of the test, both for the antibodies and for the uh, the knockout cells. So, you know, so our, our tests just kind of become better and better as more and more companies participate. So uh, it's been a fantastic process. We've been doing this for... Uh, for three years, we've been really in operation for the last two, uh, and uh, we continue to get better and better. So, uh, what we would uh, love to see is, uh, you know, we started off as a neuroscience um, operation based out of the neuro, um, but really this is applicable to proteins across all fields. You know, the, the this DK community um, uh, as well. It's all the same. Uh, platform. It's the same antibody, the same the same issues that you guys encounter that the neuro uh, folks have encountered. So um, we're very open and encouraging. Um, you know, if, if you can waste you know hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, on a failed research uh, project uh, if the antibodies are not specific. So um, we'd love uh, for you to reach out to us, put us in your uh, grant applications. Uh, the rough estimate. Um, for what it costs to do a study is between twenty-five uh, and fifty thousand dollars, depending on uh, the custom, you know, whether the knockout cell is available or whether how many antibodies need to be purchased. Um, but you know, we look at that versus um, you know the risk of using a non-specific antibody, which, uh, as Carl's kind of shown from our data, uh, can be quite high, uh, and the costs uh, of that. So. Uh, you know, we hope that you guys see it the same way that uh, we're uh, pretty cheap insurance uh, to involve us in your grant, um, have us test the antibodies before you get started. So, um, you know, we have kind of a, a science and a little bit of a business pitch uh, for you guys as well. Oh, and we should just add, uh, just very quickly, this is part of the Structural Genomics Consortium's initiative to create uh, research tools for the entire genome uh, by 2035. So targeting packages uh, and uh, antibodies and other reagents. Um, and it's really part of the, uh, you know, if you look at the GWAS data, uh, basically the, the involvement of human proteins in disease is, you know, let's say relatively level. Um, whereas if you look at the, uh, the tools and the papers and the research funding, it's largely concentrated on a very small number of proteins. So there's this huge dark genome uh, that is uh, understudied. Uh, and so by creating the high quality tools, 
uh, we hope to catalyze research into these understudied uh, areas by de-risking, um, you know, the, the prospect of researching one of these proteins, de-risking it for scientists. You know, if you're the only one studying a protein, you don't really have reference points uh, to go against. So we hope to kind of uh, plant the seeds across the entire genome to let uh, researchers flourish. Uh, and then, uh, Carl, maybe you want to jump into this slide a little bit, but these are some of the proteins uh, that we've uh, uh, identified from a diabetes paper uh, that we uh, you know, suspect are relevant to your community. So, um, you know, are the antibodies uh, for these proteins, have they been tested? Are they high quality? Um, you know, are the data associated with those uh, antibodies, like subcellular localization, are those data correct? Uh, so these are all the questions that in neuroscience uh, we had and uh, were struggling with until um, you know we until we started characterizing antibodies and unlocking kind of the identifying the high quality reagents and then unlocking the the, the next set of research pathways using these high quality reagents. So um, you know, ask yourselves: Is this the same situation uh, for the NIDDK community? And questions. Thank you. We appreciate your time. We'd love to answer any questions that you have. So, Carl, I got a one question during your presentation. How, how do you use bioinformatics analysis to, to select a target? But I guess you, you kind of explained that in the slide, right? Uh, it's a good question. So when we get a target, often, if not always, we don't have a clue about what that, what is that protein, right? Um, so the first thing we want to know is where is it expressed and which cell lines? And this is where DepMap gets very, very useful. So DepMap has a very friendly kind of, uh, uh, obviously, user, um, is a user-friendly uh, uh, integrated database. So you search for your, your protein of interest. So there we learn how, so where is the protein expressed, what kind of cell, what cell type? Another thing that we want to know is how many antibodies is there available for that protein? And is there renewable antibodies for this protein? So then I use two different databases. I use the antibody registry and I also use SciDAP. So using these two um, databases, I can have a rough idea whether there's one or two polyclonal antibody for that protein, or is there 20? If there's only one or two, and this is what we've done with DNIH for a, a project on Alzheimer's disease targets. We present these poorly covered proteins to our partners. And we invite the researchers involved in the project to try to argue and promote to put these dark proteins into their pipeline to generate new antibodies. Um, so I, I hope I'm, I'm, in, I'm answering the, the question here. Okay, yes, yeah. Are there any more questions from the audience? Um, hi, this is Marianne. Um, that was an excellent talk. And I think that the sort of work that you're doing has been long needed, right? To have almost a certification process or something equivalent to it that's uniform across all the manufacturers. Um, but is there agreement amongst the antibody community that this is the gold standard for characterizing these antibodies? Because there's many groups that will come together and say, we have validated these antibodies. Is there a disagreement amongst the best way to do that? Or um, is it pretty consistent? I think it's pretty consistent in terms of what is the best way to characterize antibodies. There's this 2016 method paper that suggested five pillars that have been used by mostly the antibody manufacturers. Among these five pillars, I would say the, sci the scientific value of these five pillars are very different. Having a knockout cell line for each protein, for each manufacturers is extremely costly. So our advantages here by pooling resources, having only us to generate that knockout cell line and characterize all the antibodies in parallel so that we can evaluate the performance of each of them is 
is the gold standard. Now, is the scientific community agreeing? At least our partners have reviewed their protocols and have unanimously agreed that we pursue our testing with these um, with these protocols. Um, we have engaged with several funders who have also agreed that our procedures are at the top of the actual modern techniques. Um, so I would say yes, we have the agreement from our funders, our partners. How often do you think, especially with monoclonals, you get drift, you get all kinds of things um, that happen. Obviously, every batch of polyclonals is different. So have you done like retesting or are you still too young for that to see how well these things hold up over time? So retesting of different lots of the same polyclonal, is that what you're yeah. referring to? Yeah, because, um, I mean, again, we know that when things, con you, you constantly are turning out uh, antibodies with hybridoma or whatever it is, that, that mutations can evolve things, batches of things don't work exactly the same as other ones. So I was just curious if you've done a temporal type of comparison. In terms of polyclonals, different lots, we haven't done so. However, we often receive the same clone number for monoclonals from different companies. And what I can tell you is, at least at, at the moment, 100% of the time, they, they behave exactly the same. And it's oh, very easy to, to say, oh my God, <laughs> this is clearly the same antibody. You go back yeah. blindly, go back to the Excel sheet. Oh yeah, it was the same clone. Um, That's now, actually reassuring. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. And I would just add, uh, you know, I, we think our methodology is the best available. Um, it's hard to say kind of gold standard. Uh, you know, one of the obvious weaknesses would be if a, a protein, a different protein with the same molecular weight um, existed in a different cell line. Um, and so we always stress that, uh, you know, the experiment that we're doing is applicable for the cell line that we've, you know, selected. And so, you know, as we expand, you know, expand, we'd love to just get more and more cell lines. We're speaking to, you know, more manufacturers, more more labs, um, but it's certainly, we think, the best available technique. Um, uh, and that, as Carl said, has been, uh, you know, kind of approved and opined uh, on to refine the methodology. All the SOPs are public. Um, you know, everyone's had a chance to look at them. Uh, you know, we, they're freely available. So, um, you know, we do believe this is the best using the techniques available, but we hope to keep refining and improving uh, the methodology. Thank you. Um, there's one question from the audience. Um, so do you plan to characterize non-human um, non-human protein antibodies? Uh, uh, yes, yes, but um, so the, the, the start, the first priority is to characterize human antibodies for human proteins for the three major applications. Um, it's simply uh, just a scope um, you know, issue. This is this is where we want to start. But uh, ideally, we would add, as Carl said, we're going to re start researching IHC um, and I, um, ICC would be uh, ideal as well. Uh, and then uh, other you know non-human proteins, obviously mouse, rabbit, viral proteins. Uh, you know, this, uh, this approach um, and just this whole idea of actually independently in the open testing uh, reagents can be truly expanded. So, you know, we hope this is, this is the start and we, we want to just keep uh, accelerating uh, and participating with more, more manufacturers, more researchers, uh, and continue to do what we're doing. And I think that's a great question. So, um, most of the time, antibodies that we are testing the, the manufacturers will 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 tell us, and it's written on the data sheet, what are the species that are taught to react, you know, with the antibodies are taught to react with what kind of species, right? So mouse, rat, human. Most of the time, we identify great antibodies that should react with human, mouse, rat. It happens only once where all the antibodies, for X reason, were... Um, um, on the data sheet, they were only targeting the human protein. So what we did is that we used a, cell, a mouse cell line, and we tested a few of them, and we found that indeed these antibodies were great also on mouse tissues. We don't do that often. Actually, we don't do that usually. 
But what I can tell you is most of the time we do identify great antibodies that should be reacting with human mouse rats. 